changes everything. Grace changes everything. Glory to God for all He's done. Hope changes everything. Peace changes everything. Jesus, the light of the world has come. This changes everything. Ran across an article this week about a guy named Soji Morimoto. We have a picture of him we're going to put up on the screen here. Uh, this guy has become famous. He has over a quarter of a million Twitter followers. He, he's 37 years old. He lives in Tokyo, and he's become famous because he rents himself out to do nothing. If you need a guy to do nothing, he's your guy, all right? His story goes that uh, he was graduated with a graduate degree, and he went to work for a publisher, and it wasn't going well. In fact, he got fired. His boss told him, I don't think it matters whether you're here or not. And so uh, as he... As he uh, lost his job, he got thinking, well, maybe there are people out there that need someone to do nothing. And so he started offering his services, first of all, for free, and then he started, now he charges 10,000 yen a call, and uh, that's uh, about 100 bucks, a little less than 100 bucks. And uh, he does, he says he, he will eat and drink and give like basic human responses. But other than that, he won't do anything. But if you, if you need somebody to do nothing, uh, he's your man. So uh, who, he has more requests than he can handle. <clears throat> uh, who, 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 uh, who calls him? Well, uh, maybe you're, uh, you have three people and you didn't want to play a game for four people and you need an extra guy. He's your guy. He'll do that. Uh, there are people that have used him to... Uh, maybe they're going to go on a date and meet somebody for the first time, but they want somebody there for kind of safety. Uh, he'll do that. Um, he uh, has accompanied people to lawyer's office to uh, sign divorce papers, someone who just didn't want to be alone. He doesn't offer advice. He doesn't offer any encouragement. Uh, but, he is, uh, but, but he's there if you need him to be there. He went with one woman to a, to a hospital visit she'd been putting off. She needed somebody kind of just with her to have the courage to do that. And the article kind of closed with these words. It may be the case that somewhere in, the, in our hearts, everyone is longing for someone who'll cheer them on. It seems this may be while we're in a person who does nothing, who doesn't tell you to do your best or that they support you, but stays by your side in silence, has endless demand. You know, it's one of the paradoxes of our time. Population keeps going up and we keep feeling lonelier. We have all this technology to connect us, but sometimes it makes us feel even more isolated. And one thing that COVID-19 certainly has done, it's made us all feel more isolated. And I've been thinking about this as we kind of get into the start of the ministry of Jesus in, gospel, in the Gospel of Luke. You know, Jesus lived most of his life in community. Jesus was very intentional about community, but he was also very intentional about solitude. Luke tells us there are times where Jesus went off by himself to pray. And actually, we're going to start today uh, looking at uh, the longest period of solitude that Jesus ever experienced. And uh, it was something that uh, was not pleasant, but it was something that was very intentional, at least in the mind of God. So uh, Jim and Debbie Windsor are going to bring our scripture reading. Let's listen to the word of God from Luke 3 and 4. Today's scripture is the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, verses 19 to 23, and chapter 4, verses 1 to 13. But when John rebuked Herod the Tetrarch because of his marriage to Herodias, his brother's wife, and all the other evil things he had done, Herod added this to them all. He locked John up in prison. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. Now Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for, only, for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at that end of them he was hungry. 
The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. The devil led him up on a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. This is the, the word, word of God, God for the, the people, people of God. God. Thanks be to God. Thanks to Jim and Debbie Windsor for bringing us the scripture reading. And we are at the point in Luke's gospel where we meet the full-grown Jesus for the first time. The last time we uh, looked at Jesus, he was 12 years old. And now uh, Luke is the only gospel writer to really give us the age of Jesus. Luke tells us he was about 30 years old. My son Isaac turned 30 yesterday. It kind of took me aback to think about uh, being old enough to be Jesus' parent. Uh, and did I just see on Facebook, Brennan, that Marley is 30 years old today? Today's Marley's 30th birthday. Happy birthday, Marley Gramling. Uh, Brennan's here in the band, and he's, he's sitting on the front row here. And uh, we wish you, you're, you're old enough to begin your earthly ministry, Marley. Uh, go, go for it. God bless you. Uh, you, you, are, you you've attained. Well, um, uh, Jesus uh, comes to be baptized by John. Now, for most people that were being baptized, it was a sign of repentance. But for Jesus, it was more of an inauguration. This is an inauguration week in our country, and lots going on in association with that. Jesus is inaugurated. You know, uh, we have this, this is always one of my, the most vivid images in Scripture for me. Uh, Jesus is there being baptized. Luke, now Luke, I told you, is the gospel of prayer. Every, uh, there's, Luke points out prayer every chance he can get. Jesus is praying as he's baptized. And the heavens open, and the Holy Spirit comes upon him. Luke describes it in this way. Uh, comes on Jesus in bodily form like a dove. Now, I don't know what that means to you, and I've, it's one of these things I always, like, I wish I could just get a picture or something to see what, what he means by that. But I always get the picture of a dove. We have some doves that kind of visit our house, kind of a dove landing on a fence post almost. The Holy Spirit comes upon him in a very tangible way. And the heavens open, and, G and God the Father speaks right to Jesus in an audible voice. You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. To, for my money, this is the most dynamic picture of the Trinity in all of Scripture. God the Father pouring God the Spirit out upon God the Son with a declaration of love and pleasure and purpose. To me, that's the most beautiful image of the Trinity in Scripture right there. You see it all happening. And you know, uh, when uh, an inauguration happens in our country, uh, I tell you what, uh, there's always a speech about how busy that the new president is going to be, all the things they hope to accomplish in their first hundred days, all the cabinet members they want get, get, uh, to, to get confirmed, all the, all the legislation they want to get through. But imagine if we inaugurated a president and they said, I'm going to go to North Dakota for 40 days. I'll be back in, I'll be back in about six weeks and uh, we'll, we'll do some things. That, that's really kind of what happens to Jesus. He has this amazing declaration. He is the one. He is the Son of God. And the first thing the Holy Spirit does as he comes upon him is leads him into the Judean wilderness. Now, uh, I had a chance to see this wilderness back in 2016 when some of us went to the Holy Land, and we saw it from a bus window, and it was not the uh, kind of place you're like, oh, could you stop the bus? I really want to spend some time here. It really is a barren wasteland, no nothing that you would ever want to see. It's about 35 miles long, 15 miles wide. Uh, the word for it there is jishaman, which means the devastation. 
Uh, it's been described in this way. The hills are like dust heaps. The limestone looked blistered and peeling. The rocks were bare and jagged. There's nothing there to, to sustain life. It was a terrible devastation, and that's where Jesus was called to battle the devil. Why on earth would the first point of business in Jesus' ministry after his baptism be to battle the devil? Well, uh, th this was a showdown that, that had to come. Um, th this, uh, it was going to happen sooner or later, and, and Jesus is going to face this head on. He's going he's to face the devil. And, you know, uh, we say Hebrews, some of you remember back last summer, and uh, one of the things we said about Jesus through the book of Hebrews is Jesus is our perfect and sufficient and supreme high priest. It says Hebrews 4.15, We do not have a high priest incapable of sympathizing with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. It's necessary. In order for Jesus to be our sufficient and supreme Savior, he needed to be tempted in every way, like we are tempted. And, and another title we have for Jesus, besides our high priest, is the second Adam. This really comes from 1 Corinthians 15. It calls Jesus the last Adam or the, the second Adam. We sang about this at Christmas time. Uh, Adam's likeness now erased, stamp thine image in its place. Second Adam from above, reinstate us in thy love. Where Adam failed in being tempted, Jesus, to be our second Adam, must succeed. And this is really unlike uh, the temptation that Adam faced. You know, Adam faced temptation in a situation of abundance. Jesus is going to face temptation in an environment of desolation. Adam had company. He and Eve could have helped one another with their temptation and held one another accountable. But Jesus here it needs to face the, the devil alone. And that's exactly what he does. He goes into the wilderness and there he's tempted by the devil. You know, it's kind of funny. Luke says he, Jesus didn't eat for 40 days. At the end of the 40 days, Luke tells us he was hungry. You know, if, if you had to edit Luke's gospel down any at all, you say, well, we probably could have figured that out. But, but Luke tells us nonetheless that Jesus was hungry. And I think he, the reason he tells us is because the first temptation has to do with food. And Satan's going to come to Jesus and say, if you are the Son of God, as was announced at your baptism, if you are the Son of God, to tell these stones to become bread. Take this stone and make it into bread. Now, I'm told in the Judean wilderness, there are actually stones that look like loaves of bread, kind of. We've got a picture we're going to put up there, and th there would be one. And I imagine that if you hadn't eaten for 40 days, it would look more and more like bread as you went along. You know, you would probably just be thinking about bread. Well, what's, what's so sinful about bread? Have you ever been tempted by bread? Maybe if you're a, a low-carb person, you've been tempted with Panera bread maybe or something like that. But there's nothing sinful about bread, right? Uh, a lot of imagery here from the wilderness. Israel was 40 days in the 40 years in the wilderness. Jesus is 40 days in the wilderness. Israel refused to trust God, and Jesus is going to need to trust God here in His wilderness experience. Uh, there's certainly some connections there to be made. So, so what is it here? What is it about the bread? What is it about this whole experience that 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 forms a temptation? Well, uh, Jesus is. Uh, uh, it's not that bread is sinful. It's really the motivation here. You know, Satan's very subtle. He said, if you are the son of God, then you deserve bread. If you are the son of God, you have the power to make bread. It, you know, exercise your divine right to do this. If you are the son of God. You, you see how he's twisting the definition of son of God. You know, uh, God wants it to be, uh, uh, son of God is going to be suffering servant. And um, Satan tries to make it a thing of privilege. Well, I'm the son of God, therefore I deserve. Let me tell you what, if you want to ruin your life, just go around thinking about what you deserve. You know, that's where credit card co debt comes from. Well, I deserve a little, a little splurge. That's where pornography comes from. Well, I deserve a little escape. That's where embezzlement comes from. Well, I deserve more than what they're, 
paying me. That's where adultery comes from. Well, I deserve a little happiness. You know, if you go around telling yourself what you deserve, that's going to lead you no place good. Jesus is not going to take the, the bait. He's going to respond to this temptation with the Word of God. He's going to quote Moses. He's going to quote Deuteronomy chapter 8. Uh, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the, from the mouth of God. Yeah, that's exactly what, what he's going to do. And so um, Satan it never runs out of temptations. Really, Satan's not that original. He just tries different versions of the same things on us over and over and over again. Uh, the Bible says it's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is really all that he has to offer. But he's going to come at Jesus in some very clever ways here in this showdown. He's going to uh, take him up and show him all the kingdoms of the world. And uh, in all their glory and all their splendor, take him up to a very high mountain where he can just kind of see it all. And, and Satan's going to declare, hey, all this has been given to me. Is that true? Well, in a way it was because Adam and Eve succumbed to temptation. They sort of handed over everything God had given them to the power of evil, to, to Satan. And that's really been the story of, of, uh, of human history is we're, we're, we're succumbed to these temptations and these worldly definitions of power. He said, I'm, I'll give, if you bow down and worship me, I will give you all of these things. You know, we've always got to be wary of um, the promise of worldly power, worldly influence, and he's going to use this on Jesus. He uses it on the church of Jesus Christ. He's used it on us very, very recently. We'll continue to use that on us. We need to be careful what God's called us to do. You know, Jesus is going to stay on mission He's going he's gonna to go out of the strength of knowing what God had called him to do. Now, one of the things that God had called him to do was to take power and authority. In fact, you know, it's announced in Matthew's Gospel of Jesus' ascension. All authority has been given to me on heaven and earth. Through the cross and resurrection, Jesus takes back that authority that has been given to the devil. But Satan's really offering him a shortcut here. He's offering something that's very, very appealing. All the kingdoms of the world. All you need to do is bow the knee. If Jesus had bowed the knee to Satan, he would have needed a Savior instead of being our Savior. But, but Jesus knows, knows better. We need to be really, really careful about grasping for worldly power. That's one of the temptations we'll always face. You know, I, I heard a Christian one time announce very triumphantly they were going to take America back for God. Well, that sounds great. Has God asked you to do that? Or is that something you came up with? You know, we've got to be really, you know, what, because if you get an idea of what God wants you to do, and it's not what God wants you to do, you need to, you're going to get off point, you're going to get off message. You know, Jesus calls, calls us to servanthood, calls us to obedience. And, and he, Satan wants to kind of get Jesus in it to a place where he's thinking, well, maybe the end justifies the means. Maybe I, can take a, maybe I can take a shortcut. Jesus does not take the bait. He's going to quote Deuteronomy again. And, uh, and, and he's going to say, worship the Lord your God and him only. You notice how Jesus responds to temptation. He doesn't argue with Satan. He quotes scripture. Jesus quotes, uh, Jesus quotes the word. And you notice he didn't say, let me look that up, Satan. I'm going to, see, I'm going to get my scrolls out. I'm going to look, look at, read the Bible and see if I can find anything on that. He's already got it in him. You know, Psalm 119.10 says, Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I may not sin against you. It's the word that's in you is powerful, not the word that's on your bookshelf. So we've got to internalize the, we've got to internalize the word of God. And that's exactly what Jesus does. I've hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against God. So um, Satan's going to come at him another way here. And he's going to take Jesus to some place very near and dear to his heart. He's going to take him to the temple. Now, Luke's gospel starts with the temple. Uh, when Jesus is 40 days old, he has interactions in the temple. When Jesus is 12 years old, he sneaks off to go to the temple. Uh, the temple is someplace that's very, very close to the heart of Jesus. And I think Jesus understands that his destiny is all wrapped up with Jerusalem and, uh, and this particular place. And so he's taking Jesus someplace very, very close to his heart. He takes him to the pinnacle of the temple and uh, where they can kind of see the city laid out before him. And Satan says, hey, throw yourself down from here because the Bible says, 
Have you noticed, do you notice here Satan can quote Scripture? In fact, he does quote Scripture here. In fact, Satan quotes Scripture all the, all the time. But he twists it. You know, we hide the Word in our heart, and we hide our heart in the Word. We don't just look at Scriptures, we look at Scripture, the, the whole counsel of God. John Wesley would call it the whole tenor of Scripture. You don't just need to pick out a verse here and there. You can do that, but you better know how that verse fits in with the big story. You know, every cult has the Bible in it, but what they do is they take a piece of the story and they make it the center of the story. They twist it and they get things out of proportion. Be careful when, you, when Brother Wonderful tries to tell you what the tenth horn on the dragon is on the book of Revelation and all that and make that the main thing. You know, Jesus always took people back to first principles. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Let's look at the first commandment here. Let's, so, sometimes we major in minors and we minor in majors. And, uh, and so Satan is, is going gonna, is gonna to quote um, the psalm saying, hey, it's a psalm about God's protection. Slow yourself down from here because God's going to send his angels to catch you and everybody will see who you are and they'll see how wonderful you are and you, what a grand entrance you will make into Jerusalem. You know, when Jesus enters Jerusalem, he's going to enter humbly riding on a donkey, not, not on angel wings, right? And, and Jesus is going to respond with the misuse of Scripture, with the correct use of Scripture. You shall not test the Lord your God. What's the difference between testing God and trusting God? You know, it may seem like a minor distinction. It's an important distinction. You know, trusting God is when you use everything God's given you, all the tools God's given you, and you trust him for the results. Testing God is saying, God, I'm going to be stupid, and I'm going to dare you to save me. You know, I saw somebody on TV one time saying they weren't going to wear a mask because they believed in God, trusted God, and God wasn't going to let them get COVID. and all. That's testing the Lord your God. It's saying, I'm going to be stupid. God's also giving you a face mask to wear, all right? So, so exercise uh, wisdom and don't tempt, don't test the Lord your God. That's what uh, Jesus is, gonna, is going to respond. Now, um, Satan is going to leave. I, I like how Luke says it here. Satan leaves for a more opportune time, a more opportune time. <laughs> you know, uh, Satan is described as a predator. He goes about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And uh, James tells us that if we resist the devil, he'll flee from us. But let me tell you what my experience is, he doesn't stay gone. <laughs> he, he, looks for, uh, he looks for a new opportunity. And, uh, you know, temptation's always there. It's always part of our life. You know, temptation would come to Jesus in the form of one of his closest friends. Jesus shared with his disciples, I'm going to go to the cross, I'm going to be crucified. Peter takes him aside and rebukes him and says, this will never happen to you. Remember what Jesus said to Peter? Get thee behind me, Satan. I hear that same voice whispering to me through you that was talking to me in the wilderness, trying to change my definition of power, trying to get me off of mission. Uh, get thee behind me, Satan. Now, I love how Luke describes Jesus dealing with Peter. He says, Peter, Satan has desired to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that, that uh, your faith would not fail. And when you are restored... I want you to strengthen your, your brothers. You know, we've been talking about good beginnings, and I just want to close with a few. I just want to underscore a couple things here about making a good beginning. First of all, uh, stay clear on your mission. You know, do what God has called you to do and be who God has called you to be. Satan just wants to knock you off course just a little bit, all right? Uh, and we've got to stay on mission, stay clear on your purpose. Jesus here is going to claim Son of God as a servant, not as a master. He's going he's to keep that uh, clear. Number two, keep the word in your heart and your heart in the word. Uh, we need to stay on, if we're going to recognize lies, we've got to know the truth. You know, when they chain, train people to recognize counterfeit bills, they don't study counterfeits, they study the real thing. And, and when you know what the real thing looks like, you'll recognize the counterfeits when they come along. Uh, number three, taking the high road means staying low. 
You know who's hard to knock over? Somebody with a low center of gravity. You know, they train football players. Get out and get down low. You're harder to knock over when you're, when you're down close to the ground. And uh, Jesus is going to take the road of humility here. Satan wants to give him to power up, to claim privilege, to, to claim power, to claim worldly glory. Jesus is not going to take the bait. He's going to stay humble before his God, even in the midst of hunger and deprivation. He's going he's gonna to do that. You know, we have a promise from God about temptation. You're going to face some temptations in 2021. Uh, Satan's going to try to throw you off. I guarantee he's going to do that. In fact, he's got some plans right now to, to just mess you up, right? But there's a promise from God in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you're tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. You know, Martin Luther, um, he uh, faced a lot of battles in his life, and he also faced a lot of spiritual battles. There were some times where Satan just seemed to be breathing down his neck. There were even times in his life where he threw things in the room. To, it seemed like the devil was just right there with him, breathing down his neck. But he also wrote that hymn called, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And I love those words. Uh, and though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear for God has willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word will fill him. Brother Luther's telling us, whenever Satan reminds you of your past, just remind him of his future. And remember that we serve a Savior that's already won the victory. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Lord God, thank you for your word today. Thank you for a, a Savior that has been tempted in every way, yet without sin. We thank you for the way that Jesus uh, kept a focus on servanthood, kept a focus on, uh, on humility, kept a focus on your word, that kept him from being tripped up by the schemes of the devil. May we do also in 2021, in Jesus' holy name, amen.